Okay, all I want for Christmas is an iPhone 7 for my two front teeth and an Apple Watch. All I want for Christmas is a chicken and AirPods and Yeezys. A go-kart. All I want for Christmas is a baseball sign from Corey Seager. And a ho new hoverboard. And an old-timey one of those. And old-timey things with the disc on it. And a dirt bike. And the thing that goes on that plays music. And a doom buggy. And got you too. All right. Well, welcome once again to Missionary. So glad that you're with us as we kick off this new series entitled All I Want for Christmas because we all want different things for Christmas. And according to our Ventura Missionary School students, there's a long list that our students want for Christmas. I don't know if you heard what they wanted, but an iPod 7, Apple Watch, go-kart, autographed baseball, and that old-time thing that plays music. Anybody remember what that is? I still got one if you want to buy it from me. You know, we got the turntable. We got the, the, the phonograph, if you will. But we got these, these things. We all have this list of things that we would like to have for Christmas. And anybody, just a quick show of hands. When you were a kid growing up, did you have a list that you wanted for Christmas? You still, okay, you had that list. Do you still, as an adult or even as a kid, do you still make a list of the things that you want for Christmas? You still, some of you still do. All right, now how about this? Have you ever gone to Santa with your list to tell him what you wanted for Christmas? Anybody out there do that? There's a few of you out there. See, in my family, we had these awesome Christmas parties. And about 30 of my extended family members would pile in the big house and we would share a meal and we would have a lot of fun and play games, but the highlight as a kid growing up is when Santa would come to our Christmas party. And he would be all decked out and he'd have his, his, his bags of presents. And we had a chance to sit on Santa's lap and he would ask us two questions. And the first question I really loved, but as I sat on, my, on Santa's lap, I would hear him ask me, Chad, what would you like for Christmas? And I always had my list. I always had the things that I wanted for Christmas. I wanted an album that you could play on one of those turn things. And I, and I, and I wanted a, some sports equipment or I wanted some video game or I wanted my own room. You know, I, there was this list of things that I would want for Christmas. I got to tell Santa that. But the second question was always more frightening because Santa would ask me, have you been a good boy this year? <laughs> and I hated that question. Because if I was honest, I would have to say, Santa, no. I've kind of been a rotten boy this year. You know, I teased my brother. I tormented my sister. I disobeyed my parents. I didn't do well in school. Santa, if I was honest, I haven't been good, but I really want what's on my list. I really want that BB gun or that album or I, I want my own room. I want, and, and so I, I, I know that there was this, this desire to get, but I knew I wasn't good enough to get the things that I wanted for Christmas. And all of us have a list. All of us have a list, whether so it's a mental list or on our phone or a list on our refrigerator, the things that we would like for Christmas. But if you had the opportunity to sit on Sam's lap and he asked you this question, have you been good enough to get those gifts that you want? Have you been a good husband? Have you been a good father, a good mother, a good employee? Have you, have you, have you obeyed your parents? Have you been good enough to get the gifts that you want for Christmas? Most of us, if we were honest, would have to answer, no. I've been kind of rotten this year. I, I, I haven't always obeyed my parents. Or, you know, I did tease my sister. Or I, I didn't really perform well at school. Or I didn't give my best in the office. Or I really hurt the person that I love the most. You know, if I was really honest, I don't deserve the gifts that I really want for Christmas this year. And there's this tension inside all of us because we want certain things, but we know we don't deserve the things that we want. And that's why I'm so glad that God inspired John to write about Christmas. But he doesn't write in the traditional way. He doesn't talk about the shepherds or the angels or the baby lying in a manger. John gets straight to the point. And John describes this this gift that we all need but we rarely receive. This gift much more valuable than toys and more powerful than money. A gift that has nothing to do with our performance, if we've been good or bad. This gift that could transform the way that we see ourselves and see the world. 
It's this gift that John describes. It's the gift of grace. Getting what we need the most, but deserve the least. And that's what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks. We're going to talk about what, what, what God has to say about grace. Because when Jesus entered the world, he came full of grace and truth. So if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to find John chapter 1, verse 14. We're going to study John, this, this, this story of Christmas through a different lens. And we're going, to, we're going to hear this gift that God gives to all of us. You see, Jesus came into the world full of grace. And this is what we read in John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Notice, Jesus was not full of guilt and truth. He, he was not full of you better be good or you better not pout or I'm going to get you. He wasn't full or if I'm coming down from heaven to punish you because you didn't behave. He was full of grace, that gift that we all need but we don't deserve. And the word in this context is Jesus. In John 1.1, 1, 1, we read that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, that Jesus was God right from the very start. But at this moment in history, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Now remember, John was Jewish, and he was writing to a Jewish audience, and they were not expecting God to become flesh. Because in their minds, God was in the temple. He was in the Holy of Holies. Like our young people learned in youth group that there was the temple or the tabernacle. And at the temple, it was the outer court and the inner court. But then there was the Holy of Holies. And that's the place where God resides in one particular place. In fact, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year with a rope tied around his ankle just in case he died, they could pull him out because it was this holy, powerful place. And that's what they had in mind. That's where God resides. So they were shocked when John wrote that Jesus was God in the flesh, that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us because they did not expect God to become a man. But he did. God became a man. He made his dwelling among us. He pitched his tent and lived among us. He was with us. And then John tried to describe what it was like to be with God in the flesh. He tried to describe what it was like when, to, to see God. And this is what the John said. He says, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father. This isn't what we thought about or what we heard about. We saw him. We saw the glory of God. We saw the glory of the one and only who came from the Father. We didn't think about him. We saw the only begotten that came from the Father. And what did he look like? What did the glory of God, how was it displayed when it came to earth? Well, he was full of grace and truth. I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase, you're full of. Well, there's a lot of things that people can be full of. You know, you're full of pride, or you're full of yourself, or you're full of whatever you want to put in there. But Jesus was full of grace. He was full of grace and truth. He was overflowing with grace. Everywhere he went, every interaction he had was full of grace. John the Baptist testified about Jesus, and this is what he said. John testifies concerning him, Jesus, and he cries out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now, this might be a little confusing, but this is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is simply announcing that Jesus was before me. He created the world, he's glorious and great, but I, I was before him. I was the forerunner. I prepared the way for the Messiah to come. So John the Gospel writer was simply saying, John the Baptist said, this is the one. We got the right guy. He, he's the one. He's the only one. John the Baptist testified about him. And what was Jesus like? 
This is what he wrote. From the fullness of his what? From the fullness of his, his grace. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. A more literal translation would be, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received grace upon grace. I love that. From the fullness of God's grace, we all receive grace upon grace upon grace. What was Jesus like when he walked the earth? He was just full of grace. And every interaction he had, it just wasn't grace. It was grace upon grace upon grace. Every conversation, every interaction, every time they saw him, all they saw was grace upon grace upon grace. And it wasn't what we expected. We expected guilt. We expected law. We expected you better be good and you better not pout. We expected punishment, but that's not what we received when we saw him. That's not what we experienced. We expected law and judgment, but we experienced grace upon grace upon grace. And later in the book of John, John writes about different interactions that Jesus had with people. There was one woman that he met with that was, um, she, was uh, uh, the, the, she was convicted or she was, um, uh, they, they, they thought that she committed adultery. She was accused of committing adultery. And so all the leaders in that community had stones and they were, gonna, they were gonna stone her. And so Jesus stepped into this environment and he says, he who is without sin, you can throw the first stone. And so they all dropped their stones and walked away. But then Jesus had this interaction with this woman that was caught in adultery. And this is what he said. He said, then neither do I condemn you. Everyone dropped their stones. He says, I don't condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. He didn't say you didn't sin. He said, leave your life of sin. You are guilty of sin. You deserve punishment, but you're not condemned. I'm not gonna condemn you. I'm gonna give you the gift that you don't deserve, but you desperately need. I'm gonna give you the gift of grace. You're guilty, but not condemned. And everywhere he went, every conversation he had, he was displaying grace upon grace. You're guilty, you deserve punishment, but I'm gonna give you the gift that you don't deserve the gift of grace. He sees 5,000 people hungry, so he gives them food. He goes to a, a party, a wedding. There's not enough wine, so he gives grace. You don't deserve the best wine, but I'm gonna give you it. He interacts with a woman at the well who's thirsty, but she's thirsty not just for physical water, she's thirsty for her soul is thirsty. And so he has this conversation with her, and, and he describes, he, he opens up her deepest wound, her darkest secret. He says, who, who, who are you? Where's your husband? Come and get your husband. She says, I have no husband. And, and, and he says to her, I know you, you, you've had five. You're going on six. And the man you're with now is not even your husband. And he revealed her, her deepest wound, her darkest secrets. But then this is how the woman responded through this interaction with Jesus. She said to many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. And this is what the woman said. He told me everything I ever did. He told me all the mistakes, all the sins that I ever made, but, but he didn't condemn me. He gave me grace, grace upon grace. He accepted me, he loved me, he, he saw all my stuff and he welcomed me in. He loved me because that's who God is. That's what Jesus did. Every interaction he had, every conversation he was in was full of grace upon grace from the fullness of his grace. He poured out grace, even when he was on the cross. You remember what he said to the criminal on the cross? He says, today you're gonna be with me in paradise. Why? That's grace. You don't deserve it, but that's what I'm gonna give to you. This gift that you don't deserve, this gift of amazing grace. Everywhere he went, he gave the gift that we all need but rarely receive, the one that we need the most but deserve the least, the gift of grace. John continues in verse 11. And he writes, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. Now we understand the law. There are many police officers and some of us have been pulled over by police officers. So we know how the law works. You, you, there's a law, you break the law and then you get punished. It's really simple, there's a cause and effect. The law is simple. You, you break the law and then you get punished but Jesus never dumbed down the law. He never dumbed down the truth. In fact, Jesus 
raised the standard of truth. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, you've heard what it said, do not commit murder. And we would all say, that's probably a good thing. Don't commit murder, never done that. I'm glad I didn't commit murder, but Jesus raised the standard. And he said, but I tell you, any, anyone is angry with his brother, he's guilty of breaking the law. Even if you're angry, even if you hate someone that's wronged you, you're guilty of breaking the law. He raises the standard. Jesus also said, you have heard what is said, do not commit adultery, probably a good thing. Stay faithful to your wife, don't commit adultery. I can say thankful, I haven't done that, that's a good thing. But Jesus raised the standard. And, and, and Jesus said, but I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And we say, oh, you know, I'm guilty. See, see, Jesus, he didn't dumb down the law. He raised the standard. He spoke the truth. He didn't dumb down, he raised the standard. And Jesus said, here's the truth about you. You're guilty. You've, you, you've done some things that are wrong. You've said some things that are wrong. You deserve punishment. In fact, you deserve death. But I'm not gonna give you that punishment that you deserve. I'm gonna offer you this gift. It's not based on your performance, whether you've been good or bad. It's not based on what you've done or didn't do. But it's based on God's love and God's grace. And that's what Jesus offers us. That's what Jesus brings at Christmas. Amazing grace. No one has ever seen God, verse 18, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. John writes, no one has ever seen God except for Jesus. Jesus is the one and only, the begotten Son. And Jesus has seen God, but Jesus just didn't see God. He revealed God. Jesus reveals to us exactly who God is. It's like taking your phone and wanting a picture of God and clicking it at the, but the sky and out comes a picture of Jesus because he's the exact representation of who God is. He's God in the flesh. He, he, he's a man, but he's not just a man or a moral teacher or a miracle worker. Jesus is God in the flesh. He's the God of grace and he comes down to give us this gift that we all need but rarely receive, this gift that we need the most but deserve the least, this gift of grace that's needed in every home, in every office, in every friendship, and in every heart. It's not based on our performance, whether we've been good or bad, but based on his love, this gift of amazing grace. You know, I, I can still remember when I was a kid and I would sit up on Santa's lap and I, and I would tell him my list and I remember the tension that I felt about not being good enough to get those gifts that I wanted. But I also remember receiving amazing grace. And one of the first times that I, that I can, can, can remember experiencing grace was during a difficult time in college. And I, I was going through a difficult time and I was doing okay with my grades, but I had to move out of my living situation and I had no place to live as a freshman in, in college. And so I called up a professor, a Christian professor, and I, I, and I told him my situation. And he said these words. He says, would you like to stay with me and my family? And I said, well, I, I don't have any, any other options, you know. So yes, please. And I remember going into his house on that first, first day there, and it was under construction. And uh, he, he didn't take me down to the lower level where his children were staying. He put his and his wife's stuff in the lower level, and he brought me into the master bedroom. He says, you can stay in my bedroom. And I stayed in his bedroom, I stayed in his house, and I ate his food, and I, and I drove his car, and I watched him raise his children in an atmosphere of grace. I watched him love his kids, and I saw this as a young believer, what it looks like to be a family of grace, to, to give one another what we don't deserve, but we really need. And I read his books, like the Ragamuffin Gospel, and I was soaking in the grace and it was transforming me as I observed and participated in this family that was full of grace. And about a year later, I had the opportunity to volunteer with junior high boys at a hockey camp. So I was the camp counselor, and there was about 20 junior high, you know, 12, 14 young kids that were, that were in my responsibility. And there were certain rules. We stayed in these college dorms. And there were certain rules at camp. 
You know, you had to be there on time and you couldn't swear and couldn't have candy in the dorm and there were certain things that you couldn't, couldn't do. And in my group of, of, of boys, two of the kids broke all the rules. I mean, they were always getting there late and they were swearing, so I had to punish them because that's the law. You break the rule and you get punished. So I had them do sprints and do wall sits and do push-ups because they were punished for what they did wrong. But there were these other two boys that were always doing things right. I mean, they were there on time and they would give their best effort and they wouldn't swear and they were fun to be around. And one night I knocked on their door and I went into their dorm room and they quickly shut their suitcases and slid them underneath the bed. <laughs> I said, what's up, boys? What's in the suitcases? And these were the two good boys. And they hummed and they hawed and they didn't want to open up their suitcases. And I say, come on, boys, open them up. And so they opened them up and to my dismay, there was the biggest suitcase of candy I had ever seen. <laughs> I'm talking ding dongs and licorice and soda pop and, and, and pops. I mean, there was so much candy full uh, in, in these suitcases. I said, what's up, boys? We know the rules. You can't have candy in a dorm. <laughs> You, you can't have candy. So I took all the candy away, and I says, okay, you got to get punished. You broke the law, and therefore you need to be punished. So you got to do, you know, three sets of 50 push-ups. So they're, they're doing their push-ups, and I had them do sprints. And, and I says, guys, when you break the law, this is what you call justice. Justice is getting punishment for breaking the rules. That's what justice means. You break the rule, and you get punishment. But, but then I says, after they did their push-ups, I says, guys, I also want to teach you mercy. So they were doing their wall sits. And so I explained to them, okay, justice is, you know, you, you do something wrong and you get punished. But mercy is you do something wrong and, and th the punishment is taken away. And so they do about five, seven minutes of wall sits and their, their legs start shaking. And I, I love that part when the legs start shaking. <laughs> and, 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 and I says, okay, guys, I'm going to take your place. So I did, I did the wall sits for them. I said, that's what mercy is. You're let off the hook. You deserve punishment, but someone else takes it for you. And so that, at, at midnight that night, I go into their, I knock on their, their dorm room. And uh, I said, boys, come on, come on down. Uh, follow me. And I brought them into the lobby of the dorm room where there was a vending machine. And I put a couple dollars in the vending machine. I said, boys, justice is when you do something wrong, you get punishment. That's what you deserve. Mercy is, you're supposed to get punished, but you get let off the hook. Someone takes your punishment. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Pick any candy you want out of the vending machine. And their eyes popped and their jaws dropped. And they're like, really? Anything you want. I'll put another dollar in. Just choose any piece of candy that you want. And so they po poked in the numbers and out came their, their candy. And we sat in the lobby of the, dormitory almost in silence as they ate their candy because they got the gift that they really need but they, they don't deserve. And, and about a year later one of the kids wrote me a letter. He says, Chad, you may not remember me but I was that kid in that dorm and uh, I got in trouble for having candy and, and you taught me three things. You taught me about justice and when I do something wrong I, I get punished. You taught me about mercy you know, I get let off the hook. And then you taught me about grace. It's getting a gift that I don't deserve. It's going down to the vending machine at midnight and getting candy. He says, when I, when I was there, I didn't understand what you were doing. But now I do. I understand God's amazing grace. I understand that he gives me a gift that I desperately need, but I don't deserve. It's not based on my performance, but it's based on his love. And I've experienced his grace. And I just want to say thanks for letting me in on God's amazing grace. Because many of us don't know it. We don't get it. It's so uncommon in our world that we don't understand this amazing gift that we all need but rarely receive. It has nothing to do with our performance and everything to do with his love. And, and sometimes we miss it at Christmas. We think we need to perform or we think that God's out to get us. And maybe this is a season in your life where you can experience the amazing grace of God. Maybe you're like the woman at the well who was hiding some things, that there were some secrets that you didn't want to share with God because you thought he was out to get you, that he was going to punish you. Or maybe you knew that you were guilty like the woman caught in adultery, but you didn't think that you would be set free. 
But that's what grace is. Guilty, but not condemned. He knows everything about me and he accepts me completely. And maybe this is a moment in your journey where you can experience grace upon grace upon grace. You can experience the amazing grace of God in a new and fresh way this Christmas season. Or maybe you're here today and and you have a hard time extending grace to others. Maybe there's family members that have hurt you or people that you work with or there's, there's people in your neighborhood or at your school and they don't deserve a gift. In fact, they deserve punishment. But you're, you're a Christian and you know the grace of God and maybe this is a season in your life where you can extend grace, where you can express the grace of God to people in your life that deserve it the least but need it the most. And maybe this is a season where you can extend the grace of God. I don't know where you're at today. All I know is that so often we miss it. We we miss experiencing God's grace in our lives. We think we need to perform to do the right things or we think that we're not good enough to get the gifts that that we want to receive. And God says to each of us, just open up and receive this gift of amazing grace. Because that's what God offers to us at Christmas. And he doesn't want us to miss it. See, most of us in our Christian journey, we start off with grace and we end in grace. But right in the middle, we kind of stray away from grace. We stray away from the amazing grace that God offers and the amazing grace that we can extend to others. And that's what we're going to do this Christmas season. Next week, we're going to experience God's grace. The following week, we're going to extend God's grace. And then on Christmas Eve, we're going to celebrate God's amazing grace. And as the band comes up, I just want to lead us in a prayer. And the prayer is a prayer for each one of us in our own relationship with God to open up our hearts and say, God, I think I need more grace. That maybe I've I've pictured you as a God that would punish me or I pictured you of of a God that would reject me and I just need to experience more grace. Or, God, or, or, or maybe it's a time where you can say, I need to extend it. I need to extend, but we're just going to, with every head bowed and eyes closed, we're just going to take a minute to pray. I'm just going to pray for you. But I'm also going to give you an opportunity to raise your hand in just a minute. Because if you're here today and you want to experience more of God's grace, if you're here to, th- th- this, this day and and, and you, you, you think that God's out to get you and you, you don't think you're good enough to receive the gifts that you want for Christmas or you don't have the capacity within yourself to give a gift to that person that hurts you at home, work, or school. If you're here today and you would like to experience more of God's grace in your life, I just want you to raise your hand with, with heads bowed and eyes closed. Just raise your hand high and say, I want it. You don't have to say it out loud, but you just by raising your hand, You're indicating to your heavenly father, I want more grace. I want to experience grace upon grace upon grace. So God, this is our heart. These are our hands. They're outstretched. They're open to you. And so we ask you, heavenly father, to pour out your grace, to give us the gift that we need the most but deserve the least, that we rarely experience it. And then, and then through that, may we extend your grace to others. God, we just surrender this next season, this Christmas season to you. And that's that we would experience grace, amazing grace in Jesus' name.